Welcome to another edition of Hit The Lights podcast. I've got a very special guest with me today. I've got Chris Guyatt. How are we doing? Yeah, good, Gary. Yeah, good, mate. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad, thanks. Uh, are you keeping busy at the moment? Yeah, just just flat out panel building at the moment. Um, so I, I, I don't know if you follow my socials. I, I put a fair amount of um, panel work on my socials and most of it's from um, my garage, which has been converted into a workshop. So I'm sort of, um, yeah, just in there most of the time at the moment. So, yeah, just plodding away building panels, designing panels, that sort of thing. No, that's nice. Yeah, I mean, panel building's close to my heart. So I was in a firm that did it for about 10 years. So that was... Yeah. Uh, did, did you do much panel building? Um, I did a bit. Um, I ended up probably jumping into a little bit of the PLC commissioning for a little while. Yeah. And then ultimately I was, in, I was just project managing and, and overseeing it, but touching yeah. on the detail where needed sort of thing. Yeah, it's... <laughs> So if I was doing panel building flat out all the time, I think it, it would probably get a little bit monotonous. But because I'm able to sort of break it up with some design work, some commissioning work, it it's quite I quite like it. You know, I quite like getting hands on and and basically seeing your designs come from a design all the way into, you know, an actual a panel which you designed. It's really nice being a part of that that whole process. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, that probably leads us into uh, the obvious first question. Um, what was your journey into the industry? I started off um, in a mechanical electrical apprenticeship back in the day when I left school near on, well, about, yeah, 16 years ago. We, it was more sort of mechanical um, biased and it was in, a, it was in um, a pipe industry. So where they basically take sheet metal and it goes along a pipe mill and it gets folded into pipe and then um, machines that weld it as it's going along so like rf welding and then other machines that sort of slice it as it's going along and seam annealers that take the weld off as it's going through this um, pipe mill um, so yeah i started off on a on a in a, in a workshop big old workshop in um, basingstoke chinham um, yeah, as an apprentice, really, just doing mostly mechanical fitting, a bit of electrical fitting, and doing like um, some fabrication work, like copper fabrication work, and obviously doing all the um, stuff through college and all that training and MVQs and all of that. Um, but I always, I was always more interested in in the electrical side, but wasn't wasn't doing that at college really was doing a load of mechanical stuff that was never applied in, in the workshop or the job that I was doing which kind of felt like a waste of time um but yeah always enjoyed the electrical um so anyway yeah so did did that for four years was made redundant at the end of that and I I think they were probably trying to get rid of me because I'd kind of had enough of working on the workshop and I wanted to go out and do service work with the service engineers like out on site and get more electrical experience and the position wasn't really available when you know I was I was your typical apprentice back in the day just not really that interested my uh, my best man uh, my wedding about a year ago he brought this up in his best man speech because I used to work with him and uh, yeah he said uh, he brought up the fact that my nickname was Knuckles because I just sort of drag my <laughs> knuckles across the floor and not be that interested, which is, I think, to be honest, I think it's probably quite rare to get an apprentice that's that's keen. I mean, I hear lots of stories about apprentices not being that good. So, but you know, it's you know, you're not interested in those sort of things when you're that young, or it's rare that they are. So, so yeah, it wasn't wasn't. But yeah, was encouraged to move on. That's when I kind of got a taste of uh, the next place that I went to. That's where I kind of got a, a taste of like home automation and smart homes. Uh, and that was joining a company, a startup in so around 2007, 2008, a company called Webbrick Systems, which if who, anyone who's familiar with Loxon, the, the green mi, uh, mini server, the main controller, like the PLC, it was very similar to that. So yeah, joined joined Webbrick and was doing panel work and doing um, sort of managing the the production line, doing R and D stuff. It was 
yeah, really, really interesting, really cool, get involved in some programming and stuff. But because it was like around 2008, the recession, um, unfortunately, it, and, and I think it was before its time, really, things in that industry hadn't really taken off yet. Um, so unfortunately, they ended up sort of going under um, and I moved on. So I was, I was there about a year, year and a half. <clears throat> moved on, did recruitment for about six months, absolutely hated it. And then I was able to actually do what I originally wanted to do, which was uh, service engineering work. Mm. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was just a fantastic experience. I early, early 20s, um, basically joined a company called Denison's, who all their work was subcontracting to Hewlett Packard. And we were basically in the industrial printing or, or basically installing their industrial printers. So massive printers, you know, sizes, just, just massive, basically, like, you know, size of size of my house, not that it's a massive house, but yeah, size of my house, like in terms of like the, the ground floor foot space, um, yeah. which would like basically print, um, the, the, the printer that I specialized in was a, a flatbed printer, which would like move back and forth with media on it and then like um, it would get printed on and this sort of media would be used in like you know the cinema billboard things or stuff right. hanging from supermarkets you know these big flat um, printed displays um, so travel all over EMEA um, was leading teams of engineers of like different um, different nationalities and yeah it was just it was just great really it was a great experience um, but it was just too much traveling in the end. So after four years of, um, yeah, of just traveling around, getting back on a Friday, wanting to see your mates, go down the pub and stuff, and then and then having to leave sort of um, afternoon on a Sunday to get back out and fly somewhere, it just became too much. And when you're sort of in your 20s and, you know, you want to do other things like see your mates and go to the gym, play rugby and all the rest of it, it didn't really work so yeah four years of doing that then did a couple of other more local service engineering roles which I got bored of quite quickly and then um, I yeah just didn't really know what to do in terms of my career um, stopped playing rugby so my, my focus was much more on my career then this was sort of around 28 um, yeah the age I was about 28 and then just start thinking about how much I enjoyed web brick and home automation really, really, it was really interesting to me. And then got in contact with an old contact um, who was actually the MD of um, locks on UK, um, who I actually worked with uh, back at the web brick systems. Um, yeah. Got in contact with him um, after all those years and there was a position at locks on. Um, so I got taken on as uh, what they called at the time. I don't know whether they still, refer to him as, as a part as a partner coach but basically yeah taken on to um, help their network of installers basically train them up and help them implement and plan projects and stuff and so got involved with demonstrations and training like proper out of my comfort zone doing doing week-long trainings to guys that yeah I've never done before and getting involved with sales on the phone and yeah demos to clients and just just ended up loving it loving the technology um learning just learning so much i was there about a year and a half and yeah it's just brilliant and then after that i did my own thing um did, did contracting for about six months then covid kicked in i had a wedding to pay for so i needed sort of regular income that's when i managed to Blag, blag a position as an electrical controls engineer, or at least it started as a, a junior electrical controls engineer at a local firm where I live. And because there was no one else there really that was doing sort of electrical apart from the, the owner who was obviously busy with other things, it sort of fell on me to do everything from, you know, the design. I'd never done design work before understanding logic and relay logic in a much more much more deeply 
yeah, and just managing the whole project really from from taking the spec, the FDS, the um, functional design spec, all the way through to the design, the panel building, the testing, and then installation and commissioning. Yeah. So again, just really, really good experience, and I was pretty much free to do what I wanted. So learning as I went, so blowing things up and burning things out. Yeah. <laughs> you know no one was breathing down my neck so you know it was just I was yeah free to do what I liked really and and learn at my own in my own way really and not many not my my boss would sort of um help me here and there but it was mainly sort of gathering information off Instagram YouTube Google and it just shows you know you can find everything that you need to know or you can find so many things to learn just by the internet which is obviously a fantastic resource you know like people ask me on instagram you know what qualifications have you got for doing what you do now and i say well none really i mean an apprenticeship back in the day but i don't think you necessarily yeah you might disagree with me gary you know i don't know what what qualifications you've been through and stuff but yeah it's just i think you just as long as you can do it it doesn't matter does it really as long as you can do design work and panel building, it's and you can prove that. Obviously, a part the whole reason for apprenticeships is on the on the job learning, isn't it? So yeah, it, it's it, it's widely accepted that that's a part of it. I think yeah. the the other aspect is obviously the certification and the formal qualifications in terms of verifying your your knowledge. I suppose is is mm-hmm. the key thing to show that you do understand. How, mm-hmm. how I mean, with that in mind, then I suppose my question would be, how have you got around the safety aspect of it? Because obviously, like to know your own competence, I suppose is the key. And and like you say, if you know what you're competent at and what you're not, but I suppose it's knowing the limitations of your own mm-hmm. boundary of knowledge, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean. And I mean, I did I did go through some other electrical qualifications like 18th edition and 2391 that that sort of expanded that understanding. But I think, from my opinion, um, everything that you need to know, you know, everything, anything that you need to find is out there on the Internet, really. I mean, it's it's quite shocking, actually. Um, So the, the BMS stuff that I'm doing at the moment, there's 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 much more awareness around like electrical control panel safety and certification and standards and C marking but there's still there's a hell of a lot of panels out there that that you can tell that they 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 don't conform to any standard they're not C marked they they're not signed off um and in the home automation and smart home industry um it, in my experience is almost non-existent um people or it's it's because a lot of it's um domestic and and yeah domestic really people just think of um bs seven six seven seven one you know electrical installation but actually the, the this standard uh, 60204 um and if you actually read in seven six seven one everything inside the panel doesn't necessarily have to or it is separate to the installation to yeah. 7671 so yeah so there's basically i don't think people realize that and it, it actually says in bs 7671 that this the scope of bs 7671 doesn't or i can't remember how it states it but it basically says that yeah there's another standard for bs 7 bs 60204 for control panels basically so yeah, it's not. It's not. There could be a lot of improvement in on the domestic side for smart homes and home automation. But again, it's because people aren't aware. Yeah, I think the the key thing is, like you say, it anyone can kind of go and put stuff into an enclosure, can't they? I think it's the it's the paperwork exercise behind it that's yeah the, dif- the difficult part when you're putting all the contactors and relays in. Mm-hmm. It's well, does that make a an inherently safe system or particularly like you know when you've got e-stop circuits and, and things like yeah. that it becomes a bit more yeah um, I, I think we in the industry that you're in and that i was in when there's um you know explosive atmospheres and when you're actually dealing with machinery where you need like safety like pilts safety relays and all of that i think it's it's far more critical in in those sort of industries and 
yeah. you know, um, IS barriers, so like um, intrinsically safe barriers in explosive environments. You know, I think it's, it's absolutely critical in those industries, less so in the building management and building automation, but it, it should still be taken into account. But like I said, people just aren't aware of it. Yeah. Uh, do you do anything to educate um, your clients in that way? Not really. <laughs> Not really. I mean, Fair if enough. I see if I see an awful panel that I know just isn't safe, and I've been to a fair few takeover projects where you know it's just it, it isn't good. Um, but it's you know the customers either inherited that property as it is. Uh, it might have been from a previous guy that was a DIYer that did it himself, um, or you know it might have been someone that just wasn't. Um, didn't really know didn't really have the educational experience um but you know it's not like they want to pay thousands of pounds to have it ripped out and redone and it's just you know when it's it's working it's just not necessarily safe so yeah you can mention it but it's it's in my experience i've never had a client that's gone ah we better redo that no yeah no i i get that i mean it's hard enough to get customers certainly domestically to understand the electrical installations let alone when you get into the yeah. realm of panels and, and compliance of parts it's um straight over the head <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um i mean so in terms of uh your what you deliver then would you be able to give a little bit more into the smart homes element of your your installations and what you do for you for your clients yeah so um so I focus on locks on obviously, so I used to work there. Um, control four, which control four is more of like a, an audio visual cinema room solution, um, and K and X. So um, and then you can pretty much do the same thing with all of them. Um, some like locks on, for example, it's it's a really good sort of out the box system for for automation but it's almost like it's not a closed system they sort of refer to it as a a clopen system um so you can do everything within the locks on ecosystem but you can also integrate other third party devices and and use various different protocols like modbus and rs485 and all of that stuff so it's a great Loxon's a great system for I think people that are getting into the industry um, uh, and for customers that are really keen on automation where they don't necessarily want to go to a light switch on the wall or or go to their app on their phone they just want things to happen automatically through motion sensors through timers that sort of thing um, KNX um, so KNX I'd say is more I'm not saying Loxon's not reliable, but um, KNX is like an international standard that you know all these manufacturers have to adhere to, and it's quite hard to um, to build products that comply, or you have to jump through a lot of hoops. So I'd say KNX is more standardised, but then to do like automation tasks, like um, uh, I don't know, for example, flash the lights when the doorbells rung. Like you can like so with locks on that would take two seconds. That doesn't take long at all. But with KNX there's a lot more programming and it's not necessarily inherently designed for automation. It's not to say you couldn't do it. So um so yeah, those there's there's all these little trade offs and then control four it's mainly sort of for you know people that like in interacting with their smart home um through um touch pads or um or remote and maybe they're more into like audio tvs and cinema rooms and stuff like that um i don't know if that answered your question yeah no yeah no it, did. it definitely did i think it probably leads into lots of other questions that i've kind of got um i mean so in terms of like the systems you implement do you find that you end up uh, hardwiring more of the stuff then do you end up using wi-fi based or is that very much customer led yeah, so if you've probably heard it before, but if you can pull a wire to it and you, yeah, do do it, you know, because um, it's going to be more reliable. There's going to it's not going to be like as opposed to if it was wireless, um, then it's not susceptible to interference. You know, you're not um, you're not necessarily having to rely on batteries. A lot of this stuff is uh, battery powered unless you've got like a local power supply. 
Um, so yeah, definitely. If you can, if you can pull a cable like if it's a full renovation or a new build, then absolutely you wanna you wanna run a cable uh, for all these different um, components. But you know, my my house for example, I've got it all kitted out with locks on, and 80% of it is is all retrofit wireless devices, and it it works perfectly okay. Um, I'm I've got relatively thin walls. It's a relatively small house you know it's a three bed um end of terrace so the 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 um, the wireless isn't struggling too much to to make that um connection and uh, communicate back to the main controller so yeah new builds renovation you want to wire it and then any sort of retrofit then then yeah you're probably gonna have to look at uh, the wireless stuff and actually the it, the batteries it, it depends where the device is in terms of how it's getting how it's um, getting back to the main controller, um, which will determine its battery life. Um, so obviously, if there's a if it's quite a long way away and there's lots of things in its way and ha- maybe it's possibly going through uh, I don't know, a metal door or a window, then it's gonna use its battery life up quicker than something that's right next to it with a clear sort of line of sight but generally you know especially on the locks on stuff the batteries last a fair amount of time and you know it's not too much hassle to to replace them so so yeah what what's one of the um more let's say i'll say complicated but one of the more interesting things that you've had to install or or automate as part of you know, your work i suppose home cinemas are they, they can be fairly tricky yeah the thing I was going to say, stuff in the, like plant rooms, basically, like um, high-end residential commercial plant rooms are where you've actually got to design, you know, all these relays and um, taking feedback from pumps and whether they're in fault or, or or whatnot, and then feeding that back to like lights on front of the BMS, um, but also into the controls like the KNX system to then have that send us an email for example when a pump goes into fault we know straight away um and we can let the customer know before they know about it so Mm. it's it's sort of the design and then like the working out the relay logic and and that that's what interests me um i haven't been i haven't done too many cinema rooms um at the moment I'd, i'd really like to um just not had not had the opportunity yet so i can't really comment on the on the cinema stuff but but yeah i for me it's it's the the bms and building management that sort of really interests me um do you find do you find like obviously you you mentioned there obviously if a pump fails you're getting the notification is that naturally following into maintenance contracts for yourself as well or um are you kind of leaving that to the the customers to manage their systems yeah it's it's i mean if we if we've got a a maintenance contract then um yeah we can sort of if if we if we're available we can get to site and put things right or you know we can can we can get in contact with a a local contractor like a a heating engineer or plumber that can that can go and investigate um we 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 kind of just don't want the the customer to um you know be left with with a system that's not working you want to get it sorted mm-hmm. as soon as possible and that's the beauty of of a bms it can be it's like it's almost a proactive response rather than a reactive response kind of <laughs> yeah. so we can put things right immediately um no no, no. i mean yeah it's obviously it's something um that naturally lends itself into that that area of work then isn't it and I think with, with, with the, on the commercial side, it's even more critical. So if you've got like a, a hotel, for example, that's meant to be providing hot water to all their mm-hmm. guests, you know, you're going to have you're going to have backup systems and um, oh, what do they call it, where they sort of have a you might know, like say you, like maybe a cascading boiler setup. So you you've always got like one spare. Um, boiler you know if the other two pack up yeah, duty standby sort of That's thing, yeah. exactly yeah. Du- yeah duty standby set up so not only with boilers but with pumps as well so you know so if a pump does go down the other one then automatically 
goes in or starts running but then in the meantime you're aware of it and then you can go and fix that that other pump yeah definitely yeah i mean that yeah like you say commercial industrial applications um yeah we utilize a lot of that in the water industry you know typically where we have duty assist and standby yeah um, all, all, all operating um and rotating them as well you know that's yeah. where it really starts getting a bit more interesting doesn't it yeah exactly so with the boilers like you, you set them into like cascading so you have one boy boiler one run for a week then it will stop and it'll move over to boiler two same thing with that and then over to boiler boiler three or maybe yeah. if they're running in pairs you, you do it you know, in a yeah, because I mean that's that's one thing we always consider <laughs> is that you don't want them all running out at the same time in terms of their life and wear. So you always run one more heavily than the others, and you have yeah. to factor that into the code and stuff. So that's always yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's at the moment that's what really sort of interests me, and I'm still sort of learning learning about it. And this is the great thing about this industry: there's just so much to learn. Like you're all there's always something new to learn, which is which is great. Yeah, no, definitely. Every day's a school day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so how do you differentiate yourself from others in the market then? So, yeah. So, I would say for for me, um, I well, firstly, I, I'd like to think that I've got really good experience with locks on because I've worked there. So, I'd say that you know, I'd, I'd be one of the in the UK at least one of the the guys with. Uh, some of the best experience so maybe that would be a selling point to me um but i think more so is is what would, which would differentiate me to maybe other guys in the industry is is being able to do the bms side you know larger residential projects and commercial projects that that need this that need the sort of the bms um and the functionality sort of thing that we just talked about um i think that i think because um they're kind of separate so you've got bms industry which is sort of mainly commercial you know hospitality and all of that um and then you've got the the home automation smart home where you've got things like uh locks on and and control four um i think they're separated and and the guys sort of on the smart home side maybe don't know as much about the bms side and the guys on the bms side they you know they don't really get involved in the smart home stuff. So I think just having, being able to offer um, BMS, you know, building management services and large plant room control on, you know, just running in the background and then have something like um, um, control four, for example, on the front end where the the, um, the customer can, can interact with and, you know, just having having yeah, like the BMS and the and the the HVAC running in the background, like integrating those two things uh, and having a an efficient um, yeah HVAC system that runs as it should, um, and allowing clients to be aware if if there uh, if there's any issues and we can get them sorted as you know proactively. Uh, I think that's probably what would differentiate me. Yeah. No, that's. No, that's always good, isn't it? Obviously, having a, a specified knowledge in products definitely uh, assists a business. And have you have, have you ever explored not partnership, but those sorts of things with with Locks On? Um, partnership with Locks On. Well, in terms of obviously your your experience with their products, you previously worked there. You know, obviously, yeah. I'm assuming there there might be some opportunities mm-hmm. there to do that sort of partnership. Yes, yeah, so. It's it's locks <laughs> locks on are a bit of a strange one. They they yeah I you know I promoted locks on for ages for for a long time since I left like on my on my socials and don't get any recognition whatsoever. Right. Which is which is actually you know what uh, and no one has no one that ever like uh, posts something about locks on on their stories it never gets reshared like like it's always been done with like Control Four. And yeah. I've never understood it. And I actually spoke to one of the marketing guys on on DM the other day and was like, why? Because I noticed they'd actually shared someone's uh, story. And it's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to be doing that more more now. But they haven't done in the past. So it's it's like they've never been interested. Um, mm. and, and because I've worked there, I kind of kind of knew that already. So 
you know, if they wanted to do something, then then great, I'll be I'll be well up for that. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try and push it myself because I know <laughs> what the answer is gonna be. You know. Yeah, and no, fair enough. Yeah, and no, obviously some are late to the party with regards to the socials. I mean, you see it with yeah. um, some of the CPSs for you know the electrical industry, um, very late to the party and 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 very light touch with the engaging. What was CPS? Um, so the likes of NIC, uh, oh. EIC, the Nappets. Okay, yeah. Um, in terms of their social media presence, I mean. Yeah, very, it is very light touch. You get kind of CPD elements through them, you know, um, professional development and stuff like that. And some some little bits of learning. Um, but, you know, they're obviously it's all promotional. I tend to find and they're, they're leading you into a path of um, exploring their content more on their website. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Just back to your back to your question. I mean, I, I, I'd i love to whether it's locks on, whether it's KNX, whether it's control Four. you know, if there's ever, you know, opportunity where we can help each other. Like, I think I think it's, it's great for everyone, isn't it? And everyone everyone benefits. I mean, obviously, one of, one of the key things is is commissioning a system. Do you, do you play a, a big part in that? So at the moment, I'm doing a lot of um, contracting work like most of the beer or all of the bms panels that i'm doing at the moment they're for they're for a, um, a business in that do high end residential and commercial in london so i've been nagging them a little bit lately to because i'm starting to get a bit um what's the word i feel a, a, I'm not getting that much human contact because I'm just locked away <laughs> in, my, in my workshop building these panels. So I'm sort of nagging them to to let me get out a little bit and get yeah. off the site and, and do some uh, commissioning. But that's what I like when I was doing um, this electrical controls um, uh, for this previous previous company. Like that's what I like. I'm not too keen on installation work, but I love getting out on site and, and commissioning it and handing it over to, to the customer, um, we, you know, which I do with like my own uh, locks on projects, control four projects. But yeah, with the BMS, there's obviously a bit more to it and making sure all the pumps are running and boilers are firing and, you know, there's much more to it, which, which, yeah, I just yeah, I I'd like to do more of it basically. <laughs> no, that's that's always good. I mean, in terms of the smart home, then uh, obviously it's a little bit more in your own domain. You're you're under your own control a little bit more. Yeah. Do you find that the the handover is the, one of the key steps to the customer to fully integrate them into the new systems? Absolutely, yeah. It's um the the amount of takeover jobs that I've been involved with um and I'm I'm locks. I haven't done any um. Control Four or KNX takeover projects. So I'm talking just about locks on at the moment, and it's nothing, not slating locks on because it's 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 whoever does the installation or has is in charge of the project. But <clears throat> there is just so many customers, are, and obviously this is why I'm taking them over. They just haven't been left with a system that is functioning to its full capability. And and it's like there hasn't been any communication, any conversation with the client as to how they live in the property, any suggestions to, you know, this might work well for you guys based on what you've just said. Um, none of that. And and then it just it's 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 just awful for the client that's just spent thousands of pounds on, on this system. And then, and then they kind of, cause they don't necessarily understand it fully. They then kind of think, Oh, it's, it's locks on locks on's rubbish. When mm. actually it's, it's the, 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 the person or firm that's installed it, they haven't properly handed over and programmed it in line with how you live. So yeah. it's, it's, it's it, it pains me <laughs> to yeah. see this, but it's, it's quite, it's yeah it's quite prominent out there yeah i suppose it's beneficial for yourself isn't it because you're mopping up at the end of the day yeah but i'd rather have the project from the start you know yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah there is that yeah i mean but, obviously next time when the upgrades come yeah um, yeah no it's great to like then have clients that you're then in sort of fairly regular contact with and you know you can go in for service calls and maybe set up maintenance contracts and you know if, if you do good jobs for them you know, people talk word of mouth, and it might, you know, one of their friends then might be interested. So, so it's all, it's all good. It's all good. In terms, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the the smart home sector, if if we want to call it that. Um, what what do you think is the next up and coming thing for for smart homes? <clears throat> Voice for sure. I mean, 
at the moment it's um it's in its early days and so when i talk about voice i'm not just talking about amazon alexa and, and google and, and apple home kit i mean those will probably be sort of the the speakers or the microphones that we speak through into our home but yeah i, I think and an assisted living as well so i just think there's with what with that and think integration with stuff like eye gaze you know for um yeah people that um aren't necessarily fully able-bodied that have to rely on things like you know speech and eye movement and stuff i think there's there's so much that can be done in assisted living and and yeah just rather than um anything that you can do with a switch or on your phone you know you can do through your voice Mm. so i think it's not there yet and i think there's there's some guys in the industry that are sort of um pioneering that um i've not done any yet I sort of wait till wait till it's been sort of tried and tested first but but yeah i think that's the way it's going i know that's a, that's a really interesting development and and energy you know energy management a- energy saving renewables obviously with the current climate i think it's inevitable that that's that's going to be a thing you know better better utilization and integration of, of renewables so solar air source heat pumps ground source heat pumps and mm electric cars and battery storage and all of that yeah have you had any dealings with any of that as yet no i haven't actually um no (laughs) but but you know it's it's stuff that i'm i'm able to do just not had any um i mean i'd I'd love i'd absolutely love to be involved in like an eco home you know proper off-grid eco home project that's using like this sort of technology to manage it all um I need to get out there and, and push it, really, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think it's definitely, I'm seeing more and more EV installs and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's definitely building. I'm not seeing so much of the ground source heat pumps or, or anything like that. Yeah, as, I think as of yet. ground source heat pumps, they're really expensive to install and you've got to build massive trenches and all of that. So they're probably not, um, yeah, most most people probably aren't up for that. But air source heat pumps that seem yes. more common yeah 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 definitely that that's probably bringing most of my questions to a a natural conclusion um i I do have one last question for you Mm -hmm. um what's your favorite movie oh uh god wow there's there's so many isn't there the 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 ones that stick in my head are are, i I love batman i'm all about batman oh you love batman even as a kid so um, Even no, the George Clooney ones? No, no <laughs> not those. No, <laughs> but yeah, I've actually just recently watched all three of the the Nolan ones again. So yeah, really love those. And I I, I watched this years ago, but it's always stuck with me. Uh, Green Mile. Have you seen that? Yeah, I do like Green Mile. Yeah, with, yeah that's good. with Tom Hanks. Yeah. So yeah, really really enjoyed that film as well. But I mean, there's loads of good films it's just remembering them isn't it <laughs> yeah all right we'll go with green mile that's a good uh, a good one to put you down as a marker yeah <laughs> no i mean it's been fantastic chatting to you so you know thank you very much for, for yeah, thanks for having me gary appreciate it yeah no brilliant and uh thank you everyone for listening <laughs>